you need to unfold it like this. Oh, cool. Now I can make one too. Did you know that some rocks have experienced ductile deformation while being close to the surface? Today, we will be discussing Ken Coulson. Oh, this son of coal. He has a PhD in geology from a Seventh day Adventist university, is a professor at a Christian college, and has published doctorate thesis. So, he has at least some knowledge in topics he discusses, I am assuming. Let's find out. These sandstones in the Grand Canyon, for example, have deformed by as much as 90 degrees. The problem from a secular perspective is that this bending supposedly occurred more than 400 million years after the rocks were first deposited. Most of you probably know what I'm gonna say at this point. What sandstones in the Grand Canyon? Can you provide a definition? Can you provide a source? I'm not saying what Ken is arguing at this very moment is wrong, but I don't wanna to have to do all the work to look up his fucking point every time. It's ridiculous. Luckily, my good buddy George Bond happened to post a comment down below referencing Dr. Snelling and some work he did on this topic. So, I went and found this paper by Andrew Snelling. It focuses on the Depeat Sandstone, so I'm assuming anything Ken Coulson oh, this son of coal. says about sandstones in the Grand Canyon is specifically the Depeat Sandstone and is probably from this paper. Because I have nowhere else to find this information out. I have to make these assumptions. But the sandstones should have turned into solid rock after only a few thousand years or perhaps as many as 10,000 years. It is impossible for terrestrial sandstones such as this to stay wet and pliable for 400 million years. And there he gives away the plot. Right? This is not going to be an actual discussion about the Depeat Sandstones. This is going to be the creationist straw man of everything must be wet and pliable to bend because he knows what ductile deformation is. Did you know that some rocks have experienced ductile deformation? So we're skipping over the fact that rocks can be ductile before they become brittle in their breaking. And we're just going to jump to it must have been mud when it was deformed. Some might object and suggest that these rocks were exposed to high pressures and temperatures during that time. Again, I have to point out, where is this coming from? Who is saying that the peat sandstones are metamorphic? I know Snelling makes that claim too. They're both trying to fight this straw man. Who's saying that? But when rocks are exposed to high pressures and temperatures, the grains in the rocks are heavily altered. This is called metamorphism, and this alteration is easily detectable. Yet, these sandstones show no sign of metamorphism whatsoever. At this point, I'm going to call in my ringer. In front of you is a paper by Lorenz Collins, a complete destruction of Snelling's work at the Depeat Sandstones, and it ain't even funny. So I'm going to be referencing a lot of what's done here, and Lorenz cite stuff as well, unlike everyone else in the creationist community. And I'll be putting a link to this below. Just so you know, it is a PDF, so when you click the link, it's going to download. To start, I'm not saying that the peat sandstones are metamorphic rock. If they were, we would be calling them the peat quartzites, because sandstone usually metamorphizes into quartzite. So, they're sandstone. That being said, Metamorphism isn't an all-or-nothing experience. You can alter minerals without changing the complete makeup of the rock. Creation unfolding skips right over that. Andrew Snelling goes a bit deeper, devotes an entire section of his paper to this conversation. Of course, Andrew Snelling ends up with the conclusion that there's like no metamorphism within the material, but again, I have to go back to my uh, ringer here, there is conversation about that because we do find minerals like illite that we tend to associate with metamorphism. So how much has the Depeat Sandstone been offered since its deposition? That's up to question. Can we say it hasn't been? No. Now it is possible given strain that works incrementally at the microscopic level for bends like this to form over large time frames. 
Good job. Really good job. But evidence for this type of strain would be evident in the rock itself in the form of microscopic reorientations of individual grains. Yet these kinds of reorientations are absent from these rocks. I'm just going to go straight to Snelling on this. In his discussion page, he does spend a couple paragraphs talking about other articles and other papers bringing up this microscopic reorientation of mineral grains. Exactly what creation unfolding is saying does not exist. Yet these kinds of reorientations are absent from these rocks. Snelling doesn't like these results and spend some time arguing why they're bad and that's a topic for another time and probably for another person not my area but it's not an open and shut clay case as creation unfolding is saying he is way oversimplifying the process and when you're talking about something that particular you really need to be honest about it shame and are we really to believe that strain tirelessly bends these rocks at the microscopic scale over tens of millions of years without any meter scale slippage. Two thoughts here. One, there's plenty of faulting going on in the Grand Canyon. Pull up any geologic map, like the one I linked below, to find that out. Two, he's being purposefully, purposefully uh, exaggerating in his claims here, demanding meter length breaks, meter length faults, in order to accomplish this bending. Why? Because it sounds big and ridiculous, not because there's any geologic reason why there's a sp specific length of fault tied to this sort of bend. It's showmanship, not science. That makes 3,500,000 earthquakes greater than a 5.0 on the Richter scale since uplift began. Does this bend look like it has experienced 3,500,000 large earthquakes to you? So tell me, do you want to go? The simplest explanation is that these rocks were not rocks when they were deformed, but rather they were wet sediment. Today we're going to use the three golden rules of sandcastle building. And the first one of these rules is only use wet sand. I don't just mean semi-wet, I mean sloppy wet. Sloppy wet just like this, so you can put it down and shimmy. You can... The creationist talking point of wet sediment causing folding is one of my most hated things they do because it's so ill-defined. How? Do, what is wet sediment? How wet is it? How pliable is it? As we can see from this guy making a sandcastle here, that's super, super wet, right? It's the requirement to build the shapes. But how long are you gonna keep it at that consistency? How long is it at the exact right moisture content all over the world simultaneously to do all the deformation you want to do all at once? Does anyone, does any creationists know? I haven't been able to find any research done on this. And that goes to my larger point that I make in basically every video. Creationism never has to do anything because the point is not to do science. Creationism is all about selling DVDs and selling books and lectures and getting views on YouTube and not producing anything relevant, anything tangible. I have no problem with creation folding as a dude. Right? There's a lot of creationists on YouTube who are straight jackasses, and I do videos on them as well. I'm sure he's got good intentions. I'm sure creation unfolding legitimately believes what he believes. And he's got a scientific background that when he speaks, he probably knows what he's talking about. But that doesn't take away from the end result being a waste. Everything he said here, when you go dig deeper, you're going to find that at best, it's undetermined, and at worst, it's just wrong. 